Well, this is BBC One. And now, the last computer programme of the series with things to come. Doesn't really look as if there's a revolution going on, does there? In fact, everything seems perfectly normal, as if the world has always been like this. But it hasn't. The world our grandparents was born into was a very different place. And yet, it's amazing how quickly people can adapt to change. Now, in this series, we've looked at how computers are going to affect virtually every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives. Now, should we regard those changes as a threat or an opportunity? What can we really expect from things to come? Well, I suppose this is the image that we all have of the past. A man, two horses, and a plough. It's traditional and it's timeless. A sort of picture of the way things were. But agriculture, like any other form of production, has had to change. And whilst the revolution on the land has been less visually dramatic than in industry, it happened surprisingly fast. It wasn't very long ago that horses were introduced on the land replacing oxen, which were slower and less manageable. But it was still only animal power with human direction. Men and women toiling in the fields is an image of the way work has always been in the past. And it's only in the last 200 years or so that production has become less labor intensive. Early farm machinery relied on horses to drive it, but they couldn't supply the power nor the speed that more sophisticated machines required. It now becomes possible for a few men to cultivate a vastly increased amount of land. Hedges and ditches disappear, and the farm laborers move away. The next step in the revolution is to introduce machines that can work without human direction. What applies to farming applies to any productive industry. The introduction of automation reduces the workforce, but allows for greater flexibility of manufacture. One of the world's largest computer companies is beginning to look at the field as a kind of production line, which could grow several different crops simultaneously. Earl Joseph. That means we can do multi-cropping in a different way, and each row could be something different. So now, instead of planting fields of wheat or corn, we could be planting fields of cookies or, or cornflakes or, or, or sauerkraut or, or pickles. And uh, what would a field of cookies look like? Well, let's look at Grandma Brown's chocolate chip oatmeal cookies. Uh, we would instruct our machine to lay down three rows of wheat. Right next to that, a row of oats. Right next to that interdispersed would be a half a row of sugar beets or sugar cane, depending upon where we're harvesting, I mean, growing them. And then a fourth row, whatever we're going to spice the cookies with, and a fourth row, whatever the machine's going to turn into packaging material. So now you know what a cookie field looks like. Now, when the cookies are ripe, uh, the machine would, would uh, we would build a micro-miniaturized factory now that would pass over that, uh, that field and grab a few of these rolls, uh, part of a, a few of these rolls, and then shake it off the stems just, and reserve the can stems just like a good cook would. Then it would grind it up, mix it, shape it in the cookies. Now it would use some of the stems to get the energy to bake it. It's already made the inner wrapping. It got the oil from some of the stems, so it's, it's waxed it and it puts a stack of cookies in the inner wrapping. And it's made the cardboard box or the sack to put the cookies, to stack cookies in, and, and it uh, puts it in there. And it stacks up these boxes on a pallet inside the machine. 
And when the pallet is full, instead of a stream of wheat or corn coming out of the back of the machine, comes box palletized cookies. Now, again, we've reached the capability point where this is possible. No new science required, no new technology. It's just a matter of getting the intelligence of the machine low cost enough and cheap enough and the mechanical parts uh, to do that. Now, imagine Farmer Brown in the fall time when he surveys the field of cookies and says, gee, it looks like my cookies are ripe. Why isn't my machine working? So he goes out to yell at the machine. By this time, the hardware would interpret the spoken language. And uh, he would say to the machine, get to work, my cookies are ripe. And the machine would, would know that this is, that is the case because it's got its sensor on the field. It's just waiting for the right moisture content. You see, machines will have reasons not to work in the future, just like people do. But in order to humor Farmer Brown, uh, the machine would go on and say, hold on a minute, Farmer Brown. I been listening to the radio, see if it can understand uh, Farmer Brown's voice, it can understand the radio. And I heard this gray-haired old futurist forecast that Grandma Brown's chocolate chip cookies are going to be a glut on the market. You know what I think we should harvest this year? Because it's dipped into its artificial intelligence, heuristics, and knowledge base. I think we should harvest this year only 30% chocolate chip oatmeal cookies and maybe 30% of sugar cookies and 10% of oatmeal cookies and the rest uh, in refined sugar and flour and oats. What goes for farming goes for other industries too. Wherever there's a repetitive job to be done, even one involving considerable skill, somebody will devise a machine to do it better, cheaper, and faster. But even on the most modern farms, as in industry, Jill Neville found jobs that happily still required the human touch. Success in dairy farming has always depended on the cowman knowing his animals. He has to give each cow his individual attention if she is to give her best yield of milk. Peter Mills has a herd of 150 cows in the Itchen Valley. Two years ago, he bought a small computer in order to provide the cowman with detailed information about each cow, as well as an instantly available overview of the entire herd. The yield of each cow is entered once a week, along with any other relevant information, such as feed, date of calving, or veterinary inspection. Got the right. concentrate the pumps. Okay, let's just have a look see. Um, <clears throat> Louise, I think we seem to have a problem with one or two of these cows. Number 143, she's dropped by 50% down to four litres a day. Um, can you let me have a individual cow record? Yes. Um, so we can have a. 143, you, you said. 143, yeah. In fact, she's only been in milk about 200 days, so I think we've got to really decide on that one whether it's going to be worth keeping her. Yes. Um, I think one of. Her. I'm not sure when she's due. She's calved in February last year, so I think she's due about the same time. But I doubt whether she's going to be worth keeping for February, so I think that one's going to have to go. With the help of his computer, today's farmer knows as much about his 150 cows as his predecessor knew about his herd of 20 or 30. But there is a difference. Though the computer supplies the farmer with information about his animals, it may be he no longer knows them as individuals. This could also be a problem in professions involving people and computers. A microcomputer like this will probably turn out to be just the very early stages in the development of this technology. But even if you put it to work now, it can still offer something very valuable. Computer power at very low cost. Costs far less than it would cost to have a person to do the same job. And unlike people, once you've taught it, it never forgets. It's capable of working infinitely long hours, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You don't have to provide light or heat for it. And in fact, it consumes less power than a 60-watt light bulb. In other words, it's the perfect slave. So how are we going to use this perfect slave? 
So far, we've suggested that automation and computers will profoundly influence production and service industries. But there's another job which is increasingly important in today's society, the processing of information. And that's where the computer is going to have its most profound impact in the future. Now it says here, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of one pound. And it's signed by the chief cashier of the Bank of England. Well, here we are, the Bank of England. Trouble is, if I go in there and demand my one pound, the chances are all I'll get is another one of these. The truth of the matter is, money doesn't really exist, or rather, whatever money is, it certainly isn't one of these. All this is, is information about money. So is a check, or a banker's draft, or a letter of credit. They're just information about money, and they're just some of the millions and millions of bits of paper that get shuffled around the city of London every day. If I want to pay my electricity bill, the most convenient place to do it is in the High Street branch. But the electricity board have their account at the branch of another bank over a hundred miles away. So the question is, how does the electricity board get credited with my money? Hello. Can I pay my electricity bill? I think that's the right amount. We'll soon find out. That's the last we'll see of money. All that leaves here tonight is a piece of paper proving I've paid the correct amount. And what happens next is an extraordinarily complex process taking all of three days. Journalist Rex Malik has been following it. Chris's payment record goes first at the Barclays Bank Clearing Centre in the city. It's just one of the many millions of payments handled daily by the four main clearing banks. On an average day, Barclays themselves will handle nearly five million items, worth nearly 15,000 million pounds and weighing 10 tons. The paper chase we are following is probably one of the world's most complex, routine, large volume, paper handling operations. Checks go their separate ways to computers, but all other items, such as Chris's payment slip, have to be handled manually. This first sort will separate all the payments Barclays have to make, bank by bank, and then add them up, because what Barclays needs to know is how much it owes to each of the other banks. Nobody in this operation wants to know why any payment is made, or indeed who the payment is to. All the operations that these people here are doing are concerned with speeding the correct information on its way to the correct bank and the correct account. You'll remember that Chris paid his electricity bill at a Barclays local branch, but the electricity board have their bank account at a National Westminster branch. While Barclays have been sorting their pieces of paper, all the other banks have been doing the same thing. And before lunch on the second day, all the paper goes to a central clearing point, where they exchange it with each other. And somewhere in that lot is the record of Chris's payment. It's destined for the National Westminster Bank's clearing centre, not half a mile away, where all the processes will have to be gone through again, but this time in reverse. What came in in bulk has eventually to leave here this evening in individual packages, each bound for a particular National Westminster branch. 
When one looks at a scene like this, one is tempted to ask, surely there must be another way for people to spend their lives. There will have to be, because jobs like this, in which people are just used as a convenient interface between machines, will probably disappear quietly and forever during the 80s. Should we be glad or sorry? In my opinion, we should be glad. People are too precious a resource to waste on mechanical work of this kind, when there are so many tasks waiting to be done, which would be more fulfilling to the individual and of greater worth to society. Computers, Chris said, are perfect slaves. More than 30 years ago, Norbert Wiener, one of the founding fathers of the computer age, had this to say. Any labor that accepts competition with slave labor accepts the conditions of slave labor and is essentially slave labor. Chris's payment has at last arrived in Ipswich. And now, irony of ironies, the information is finally fed into a computer. A computer which is kept in the heart of the very clearing center in which all those people were shuffling paper. The electricity board has finally got its money. The story of one piece of paper, but multiply it by the thousand million or so transactions that have to take place here every year and that have to be cleared within a day. And you can see why the city of London is crammed into such a tiny space. The buildings are rubbing shoulders with each other and the office workers have to be within walking distance of each other. But the one thing that those office workers are exchanging and dealing with is information. And that's the one thing that computers can handle more quickly, more cheaply and with greater accuracy. All it needs is for every form like this to be standardized so that a machine can read it, so that every branch of every bank in the country can have a terminal linked to a central computer. Now, when that happens in the next 10 years or so, and it is going to happen, that means that I can go into any branch of any bank in the country, pay my money, and get a receipt back at electronic speed. The city exists for one major reason. For only by making a payment here can you guarantee it will be paid in a single day. But what price a city when any payment anywhere can be cleared instantaneously? And what price the jobs of the people who work here, doing things that a computer can do? And what goes for the city also goes for all of the world's great financial centers. Charles Lecht, chairman of Advanced Computer Techniques Corporation in New York, takes an optimistic view. What are all the people doing in these buildings during the day? They go up and down in elevators, and as you know, they shuffle paper and they make telephone calls. Some even run computer systems. But the majority of these people are really engaged in tasks which may be better done by machines. You know, I really do believe that machines can do everything better than people. But I didn't say be better than people. I said do. If machines could do our bidding, we could be what we would like to be, to aspire to the heights with, with, to which we aspire. I cannot conceive of a world where we keep constructing real estate and edifices of these kinds, where we keep putting people into them and dehumanizing their daily existence by asking them to do things, to be at a place they don't want to be, at a time they don't want to be there, to do what they don't want to do. That's my definition of work. But if man is not working, it doesn't mean he's idle. He's creating. I think that man's future will be enormously dignified by the employment of tools to improve his productivity and to decrease the cost. In the beginning, there was a gaffer. And the gaffer, the village blacksmith by trade, had a mouse problem. 
so he made a mouse trap. After a week or two, it turned out that this caught mice faster than any other mouse trap had ever done before. Word spread, and suddenly everyone wanted his better mouse trap. He just couldn't make them fast enough. So he put his sons to work to also make even better mouse traps. That gave him more time to make deliveries and take new orders. Demand grew for word had now spread throughout the surrounding countryside. But now when he came home late at night, he was often tired, much too tired to do the paperwork. So he asked his wife to look after the accounts and pay the taxman. But his sons were young and they liked to fool around. A mousetrap production often seemed erratic. So regretfully, because he liked calling on his customers, he hired a peddler to go out and sell them for him while he stayed at the smithy to supervise. But today, a century on, the local smithy has become the headquarters of the world's best mousetrap corporation. He's got plant and officers in every country in the world and thousands of employees. What his sons did has become manufacturing. What his wife did has become finance and administration. The peddler has become sales and marketing. And he and the supervisor, of course, have become management. I suspect if he was around today, he'd still be attempting to make an even better world's best mousetrap and he'd be working in research and development. But of all these thousands of people, very few of them know anything about mousetraps. In fact, some of them have never even seen a mousetrap. What they do is add up figures. They write memos to each other. They work out each other's wages and generally shuffle paper. And as the company grows, more and more of these people are taken on just to support those very few people who really understand how to manufacture and sell mousetraps. Today, the silicon chip promises to replace most of those people and most of those processes and allow the gaffer to build and sell as many mousetraps as he wants without them. Indeed, the mousetrap corporation, one can observe, is probably built on sand. And the sand, in the form of silicon, is slowly but surely gobbling it all up. I think computer technology is now developing so fast that we have to face the question, what happens when and if it's that can do, as Charles Lecht said, everything better than people? Because when that time comes, the next question is going to have to be, then what shall people do? It is possible that we may manage to create an entirely new society with new ways of satisfying people's basic human needs of uh, dignity and some purpose to their lives. But to do that, we shall need ideas, and rather better ideas than the usual vague suggestions to abandon the Protestant work ethic and uh, create the leisure society, whatever that may mean. In this series, we've tried to show you something of what computers are and how they can be used. Whether they should be used, and if so, how and to what purpose, are questions we haven't had time for. I hope they will be taken up elsewhere. BBC publication entitled The Computer Book is available from bookshops, price £6.75. For details of other parts of the project, including the BBC microcomputer system and BBC application software, the associated NEC correspondence course in programming and information about courses, computer clubs and other sources of advice in your area, please send a stamped addressed envelope at least 12 inches by 9 inches to... 
Broadcasting Support Services, P.O. Box 7, London, W36XJ. And please indicate clearly what information is required. BBC One, and now we follow this week's engineer on a day in his working life. <laughs>